So we have the very first episode of Anita Sarkeesian and Laura Hudson's Ordinary Women series. Before we delve into this thing, remember something. This video cost $25,000 in post-production costs alone. Since Feminist Frequency invested $20,000 of its own money just to write and shoot these videos, then on average that means each episode cost an extra $4,000 in pre-production. So at a budget of $29,000, the first episode of Ordinary Women, Episode 1, The Revolutionary Life of Emma Goldman, comes out to a length of... 5 minutes and 50 seconds. Yeah, not half an hour, not even 10 minutes, just under 6 whole minutes. That means that for this episode, it cost on average $82.86 per second. Holy crap, I wish I was paid that kind of money. But here's the hilarious part. Anita Sarkeesian said there would be gorgeous animation featured in these videos. Each episode will focus on one of these women and feature gorgeous original animation with a style inspired by both the person and the time period when she lived. Well, here's the animation. Look at it. If this animation strikes you as anything, does the word gorgeous come to mind? No, but there's more to consider yet. All these scenes where Anita stands alone against a white screen was already paid for by donations to her own organization, Feminist Frequency. We've already invested $20,000 and a lot of effort from our team to lay the groundwork for the first season of Ordinary Women, but we need your help to make this series a reality. If we cut out all the live action only segments in this video and compile all the footage that has animation in it, we have three minutes and 25 seconds of animation. That's it. For all those people foolish enough to donate to this project, you pay $25,000 for less than three and a half minutes of colorless, lifeless animation, the total of which cost you a whopping $121.95 per second. We haven't even got to the factual material in this video, and the scams are already piling up. Now let's see what Anita has to say about Emma Goldman herself. Years before her critics dubbed her one of the most dangerous people in America, a young woman named Emma Goldman found herself at a dance. Although she was a political activist attending the event to gain support for her cause, she also just loved dancing. So much so that one of her allies took her aside to criticize her for being frivolous and undignified. After all, should a serious activist be seen having so much fun? Furious at the interruption, Goldman told the young man to mind his own business because the liberty she fought for was not about the denial of life and joy. Instead, she said, I want freedom, the right to self-expression, everybody's right to beautiful, radiant things. For Goldman, a revolution without dancing was not a revolution worth having. So in 40 seconds and approximately $3,314, we basically just listened to Anita Sarkeesian reading off Emma Goldman's Wikipedia page, a page that contained all that information since at least as far back as August of 2005. Remember when I said the information from Anita Sarkeesian can be obtained for free by anybody who already has a decent internet connection? This is what I'm talking about. However, not everything Anita says about Emma Goldman is wrong. Goldman rejected traditional notions of marriage and chose never to have children. Anita says plenty of things about Emma Goldman that are true that aren't particularly remarkable, but as is typical of Anita Sarkeesian, there are plenty of problems. For example, she was born in 1869 to Jewish parents in the Russian Empire and raised by a distant mother and an abusive father who tried to force her to marry at age 15. Hang on just a second. Anita slash Laura Hudson say she had a distant mother and an abusive father. Well, according to Emma, they both were abusive, just one less than the other. In her autobiography, she wrote, I left without regrets. Since my earliest recollection, home had been stifling. My father's presence terrifying. My mother, while less violent with the children, never showed much warmth. Although she was heterosexual, Goldman was one of the earliest American advocates for gay rights. Well, if Anita wants to say that Emma Goldman was an advocate for homosexuals to have sexual relations without fear of legal punishment, she'd be right, but that's about as far as Emma Goldman went. We hear the phrase gay rights and we think of gay marriage, for example. But Emma Goldman didn't believe in marriage between straight people, so she wouldn't exactly be able to argue that homosexuals should marry either, though she probably would grant them the freedom to do so if they so desired. She was horrified by the tragic story of several labor activists who were executed in Chicago and found herself drawn to the labor movement and eventually to anarchism. Contrary to what that word might suggest, Goldman's philosophy was not about disorder and chaos. Well, sure, Emma Goldman said that anarchism wasn't about disorder and chaos. That didn't stop her from becoming an accomplice to an attempted murder. Wouldn't you know, this episode never mentions that awkward little inconsistency on Emma Goldman's part, but apparently that doesn't matter. 
What's odd is that Anita Sarkeesian does mention that Emma Goldman encouraged people who couldn't find work to find people who had food and to take it from them. Over the years, Goldman was sent to prison for her ideas several times, once for promoting birth control, once for discouraging men from registering for the draft, and once for telling unemployed workers to take bread from the wealthy if they were deprived of work and food. She encouraged one part of the population to turn on the other and steal food from them if there wasn't any work they could perform to earn it. Yeah, that sounds really smart for such a non-disorderly, non-chaotic anarchist, but it's not like Anita Sarkeesian or Laura Hudson care about such things. Emma Goldman was dangerous and defiant. Who cares if she was completely inconsistent? It was about personal freedom and rejecting institutions she believed were repressive. Government, religion, war, business interests, and even marriage. What is she grinning about? Anita Sarkeesian, what the heck are you grinning about? What is it about Emma Goldman's low opinion of marriage that makes you so happy? What the heck? What kind of person grins when she's saying something like that? Despite her support for female independence, she often found herself at odds with suffragists, believing it less important to get women the vote in systems she viewed as oppressive than to dismantle them entirely. False. This is where you have to roll up your sleeves and do some digging to figure out where Anita Sarkeesian and Laura Hudson aren't being straightforward with the facts. Emma Goldman did not, as Anita said, see the vote as less important. She said women absolutely would not benefit from gaining the right to vote. Period. I covered this in my own video way before this first episode even came out. Would Anita like to agree with Emma Goldman's view that the female gender wouldn't be held at all by having the right to vote? Emma Goldman writes on page 173 of Anarchism and Other Essays. Yet all these disastrous results of the 20th century fetish have taught woman nothing. But then, woman will purify politics, we are assured. Few countries have produced such arrogance and snobbishness as America. Particularly, this is true of the American woman of the middle class. She not only considers herself the equal of man, but his superior, especially in her purity, goodness, and morality. Small wonder that the American suffragist claims for her vote the most miraculous powers. In her exalted conceit, she does not see how truly enslaved she is, not so much by man as by her own silly notions and traditions. Suffrage cannot ameliorate that sad fact, it can only accentuate it, as indeed it does. There is no reason whatever to assume that woman in her climb to emancipation has been or will be helped by the ballot. Emma Goldman's position was not that the vote was good by itself. She categorically denied that. Anita did quote Emma Goldman as saying, Emma said, the right to vote or equal civil rights may be good demands, but true emancipation begins neither at the polls nor in courts. She said it begins in woman's soul. That's an accurate quote, though what wasn't quoted was this little sentence from the exact same article. There is no hope even that woman with her right to vote will ever purify politics. And this essay comes directly after the other essay you just heard me read from in the exact same book. The vote wasn't necessarily good or bad to Emma Goldman. Without women's soul or her fight to live her life as she chose, the vote was useless. She wasn't opposed to it per se, she just didn't see it as evil or good. But we have Anita Sarkeesian and Laura Hudson taking her one quote about gaining the right to vote as maybe a good demand, and running wild with it instead of taking the time to carefully consider what Emma Goldman really believed, which is neatly encapsulated in the following extended quote from one of the excerpts I quoted before. Yet all these disastrous results of the 20th century fetish have taught woman nothing. But then, woman will purify politics, we are assured. Needless to say, I am not opposed to woman suffrage on the conventional ground that she is not equal to it. I see neither physical, psychological, nor mental reasons why woman should not have the equal right to vote with man, but that cannot possibly blind me to the absurd notion that woman will accomplish that wherein man has failed. If she would not make things worse, she certainly could not make them better. To assume, therefore, that she would succeed in purifying something which is not susceptible of purification is to credit her with supernatural powers. Since woman's greatest misfortune has been that she was looked upon as either angel or devil, her true salvation lies in being placed on earth, namely in being considered human, and therefore subject to all human follies and mistakes. 
Are we then to believe that two errors will make a right? Are we to assume that the poison already inherent in politics will be decreased if women were to enter the political arena? The most ardent suffragists would hardly maintain such a folly. I think Laura Hudson and Anita Sarkeesian would count as very ardent suffragists, so it's no wonder they have a problem accurately describing Emma Goldman's low view of the female vote. It's funny that they claim to admire Emma Goldman for being so dangerous and defiant, yet they casually brush over the painstaking detail Emma Goldman went through to outline exactly what she believed about how women would achieve freedom, because it's just not feminist to say that women don't need the right to vote. At the end of all this, are we really surprised that this first episode of Ordinary Women turned out to be such a piece of garbage? Are we really that surprised that Laurel Hudson and Anita Sarkeesian misrepresent the facts? And all for such vast amounts of money. And this is just episode one of Ordinary Women. God only knows how many more errors and flaws will be in the rest. But when the other episodes come out, the Prince Asbel channel will be there to catch them and show them to the world. If you think this video was worth your time, I'd love it if you'd click the like button and the subscribe button in that order and share it wherever you can because the more views I get, the more videos I'll make. Thanks for watching, I am Prince Asbel and I can't wait to see you again on the Prince Asbel channel.